This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God over all. And even over those who don't yet confess Jesus Christ as Lord, you are Lord over them as well. And Lord, we thank you for regulating revelation of your holy truth. By your spirit, you're the one that illumines the truth into our hearts. And we pray for more revelation in our church. We pray for more revelation given to us, not just so we can store it or hold it or keep it unto ourselves, but so that we can share it with others. As we get light, as we get knowledge and discernment and wisdom, I pray that you give us the unction of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit, to then share it with others. As we come to know who you are, let us be a people that wants to testify to the greatness of your holy name. Lord, you are so holy, even your name is holy, and we pray that your name will be hallowed in our church, in our hearts, in our lives, and we pray that your name will be hallowed and considered holy and revered in the city. Lord, there are many who don't yet follow you, don't yet even believe in you, and we pray for a revival, we pray for an awakening. We do believe that your kingdom is unstoppable. You promised that there was nothing that is going to remain hidden. You will reveal all truth. And we pray, Lord, use us in the process of of this harvest, of drawing many to yourself. Uh, Give us a zeal, a burning zeal in our hearts to do everything we possibly can to see people whom we love uh, come to faith, to receive eternal life, to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and to receive forgiveness of sins in a relationship with you. Lord, we pray that you instill a hope in us, a hope that is unshakable, so people around us do realize there's something different uh, about these people. Uh, they do believe, and they build their life on this hope. And we pray all this in Christ's holy name. Amen. We're continuing our sermon series through the incredible gospel of Mark. We've called it Kingdom Come, the gospel of Mark, and the secret of God's kingdom. And the title today is The Unstoppable Kingdom. Question, what's one thing that grows the more you share it? The more you give it to others, the more you test, the more you share, what what is that one thing that grows? And I would submit to you, it's your faith. The more you share your faith, the deeper your faith gets. The more you testify to the truth of God, the deeper your understanding of that truth is. Jesus Christ told us, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I'll make you compel people to come into the kingdom. I'm saving you as an instrument of salvation for others. That's uh, part of our purpose. 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts... Honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. We should be such hope-filled people that people around us are like mesmerized by this hope that we have no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation in the world, we have an unshakable hope. Why are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, it's because the Lord sent someone to you at some point to sow the seeds of God's word into your heart. And the fact that you're following Jesus today is evidence that the seed was planted into fertile soil. The seed goes deep and it germinates and a root system goes deep into your heart. And that seed grows as it is nourished by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit bears fruit through us. And the fruit that the Holy Spirit bears has seeds, and that's the seed of God's word. And we are then to take those seeds, and we are to sow those seeds into the heart soils of other people. And then by the power of God, they too are saved. They're saved from God's judgment. They're saved for God's kingdom and his mission. And the intention is clear from these parables that the Lord is giving us today. We ought not only to receive knowledge, But do everything we can to impart that knowledge to others. And this is how the kingdom of God grows in your life and in 
the world. Today we're in Mark chapter 4, verses 21 through 34. Would you look at the text with me? And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. But to the one who has, for to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seeds, seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. This is the reading of God's holy, inerrant, fallible, authoritative word. May he write these truths on our hearts. Three points to frame up our time. First, love the light, hunger for truth, and share the gains. Second, sow the seed, trust God for growth, harvest is coming. And third, there's room for all in the kingdom of God. First, love the light, hunger for truth, and share the gains. So Jesus in the previous text has interpreted the parable of the sower, and now he gives us a few more parables of the lamp, of the hidden and the manifest of having and not having, and that the kingdom grows like seed. These parables with their emphasis on revelation and the necessity of paying attention extends the theme of the word and its hearers. Verse 21, and he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed, and not on a stand. Uh, Jesus uses very similar phrasing in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, the text in Matthew 5 is very clear. Don't hide your light. Be good witnesses to Jesus Christ in this world. Do good works so people see the good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. It's tempting when you come across a text like ours to say, oh, there's a similar phrase that's used in a different text like Matthew 5, and just assume that Jesus means the same thing because he used the same phrase. And... Jesus, just like us, often uses the same expressions in different contexts to communicate different truths. So just because Jesus is using the same image or the same expression or the same fr phraseology doesn't automatically mean he's saying the same thing. We have to pay attention to the context. In Matthew 5.15, Jesus is urging us to do something. You shine your light to the world. Here, uh, Jesus is promising us something wonderful. He's not just calling us to action, but he's giving us a promise. And the promise is about the destiny of the kingdom of God. The parable is teaching us that the future for the kingdom of God is bright. And I just want to point out uh, a couple things from the text. Uh, in our translation, the English standard, it just says a light. Uh, there's no definite article. Def uh, definite article is the uh, in the original Greek, there is a definite article before the word lamp, so it's the lamp, a particular lamp is in view, uh, and where uh, the text says that the lamp is brought in, the Greek actually says, does the lamp come in? It isn't brought in, it comes in all on its own. Uh, it, there's a personal agency ascribed to the lamp, meaning the, the lamp is a person, 
The lamp comes in. The lamp here is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what Jesus taught us about his identity in John 8, 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will give, uh, will have the light of life. So probably the best way to read verse 21 in our text is that the lamp is the revelation of God and his kingdom as has come in the person, the words, the works of Jesus Christ. It's a message, a revelation summarized in the message of the gospel. And if the lamp is here and the gospel of the kingdom is here, Jesus is saying, what's the intent? It's here in order to be exposed. It's here in order to shine. Uh, and this is what he's telling his disciples. He says, be patient. When it looks like the darkness in the world is oppressive, when it looks like there's so much darkness that no light can penetrate that darkness, be patient. Continue to believe. Even with Christ, many were opposing him. Uh, there was an antagonism that was growing amongst the scribes and the Pharisees, and partially because they didn't want the light of God in their life. And this is a lot of people, they want God's love, but they don't want God's light. But God is love and he is light and you can't have one part of him without all of him. Uh, many people love John 3.16, a, a verse that many have memorized even since Sunday school. But in the context about God loving the world, uh, he does say like the world has rejected this love because they don't want the light. They want to continue living in darkness. Look at John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out. In God. He's saying the light has come and the light has come in the form of Jesus Christ, and people rejected him because people loved darkness. And this is what uh, the, the difference between a believer and an unbeliever a believer has a brand new heart. You're regenerated. When you repent of your sin, you're given this brand new heart that longs for God's light. You want to love the light. You love standing in the light, living in the light. You love being a, a child of the light. And you love God's word because God's word illuminates more of your life. It shows you more of the ways that you are to walk in and the ways that you are not to walk in. Light that shows the way to live. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So even in the short term, God intends those outside, even if he does intend that they misunderstand this word, it's not going to be hidden forever. The truth is here, and even if people suppress that truth, there will come a point where the suppression is no longer even possible. Uh, Mark 4.22, Jesus continues, says, For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. He did not come to have his light hidden away. And the whole point of his coming in this veiled form, often rejected form, was so that the light might shine undimmed to the ends of the earth. He came in weakness and suffering. He came as a seed to be buried in the ground. Look at Isaiah 53, one of the most powerful prophetic passages about the person of Christ. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Just as in the past, nothing was hidden except in order to become manifest. So Jesus is saying, this is true. 
Even now, in the present, all the hiddenness of the current age will ultimately serve the purpose of revelation. And this is exactly what happened with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is God, the Son of God, King of kings, comes and he proclaims the word of the, of the kingdom. The kingdom is here. Repent and believe. Everyone who repents and believes is welcome. But the opponents of Jesus, they misunderstood his word, and they rejected it. The word didn't penetrate their hearts. It, it didn't transform them. But this rejection of the word led to Jesus' death, and as a result, from the divine perspective, it led to ultimate revelation, more revelation. He was killed by those who refused to believe his word, refused to see his identity. But in this divinely willed death, which is caused by this, their spiritual blindness, God ushers in a brand new age of revelation. After Good Friday and Easter Sunday, Jesus now is proclaimed as the Messiah, as the Son of God. And after the Holy Spirit falls on Pentecost, now when the message of the gospel is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit takes that message and transforms people. He saves people. The obscurity of the word ultimately serves to lead to greater revelation. The lamp of God's word has come into the room and is casting its light into every crevice for everyone who would welcome the light into their heart. 1 John 2, 8 through 11, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is, the, he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. At the same time, we look around the world and we say, well, if, if the light has come and the light is revealing the kingdom of God, why aren't more people Christians? Why aren't more people following the word of God? And Jesus here says, there will come a time when everything is revealed, and at that point, it will be too late. The kingdom will not remain hidden forever. It is seemingly hidden now uh, in that its full power is not evident. It's concealed in some way. But there will be a day when the kingdom is completely revealed because the light of function is to expose the darkness. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ cannot stay hidden. Nothing can obscure it. No shadow can engulf it or eclipse it. Why are we believers? Because God shone his light into our hearts so that the knowledge of the glory of Jesus Christ is understood. The light of the gospel is chasing away the shadows of unbelief. And the people who walked in darkness are beginning to see the light. And what's our job? Our job is to believe this promise, that the kingdom is unstoppable, that the gospel light will continue to shine and God will draw the elect, will draw his children to himself. And what's our job in the process? We are to love the truth, hunger for the truth, and impart the truth for others. The light isn't just given to us for, so we enjoy our lives here on earth until we go to heaven. No, we have work to do to testify to Jesus Christ that he alone is the doctor of our souls, that he alone is the way to salvation. There's no other name by which anyone will be saved. That day, the judgment day, or when Christ returns, will reveal that to everybody. And for most people, it will be too late then. And I understand in a place like Boston, it's easy to lose your hope. You look around, you're like, we are outnumbered. Big league, we are outnumbered. We, we are on the losing side. And that is a lie of the enemy. As soon as you begin to believe that lie, we lose the power. We are to believe that Jesus' kingdom is growing, will continue to grow. And sometimes it feels like our light just isn't enough. It feels like you're in Fenway Park, all the lights are out, you're by yourself, and uh, you, know, you want to light up the night just a little bit, you take out your phone with a little flashlight, and you're like, yeah, the light of Jesus. And uh, it looks pathetic, puny, flickering even. Uh, it seems like the darkness is absolute and penetrable. You, can, you say, what can my little light do? And then you realize, it's not my light. It's not my light, it's not my lamp. It, the light is Jesus Christ 
himself. The light is God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Do you believe this? Do you believe that there is no one beyond the reach of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that there is no heart so hard that grace cannot soften it and change it forever? The light will pierce the darkness. We just need to proclaim that Jesus is the light. He is uh, the, the only way of salvation. And I'm confident of that because of the promise here, that the light came not to be hidden. It came to blaze forth and to give light to the world, and nothing can stop Jesus Christ. Nothing can stop the King. Uh, last week I shared that I had a toothache, and thank you for all your condolences. Uh, it was supposed to be solved on Tuesday. I woke up the happiest person to get a root canal ever. Uh, I, woke, I even got a shirt uh, buttoned. I was like, I'm ready to go. Did my hair. I'm like, I'm ready to go to the end of the dentist. I show up and they say, thank you for coming for your consultation. And I was like, why? No. And so uh, the, my uh, dental appointment is on Tuesday. Tuesday is coming. Praise be to God. And uh, so I was at a staff meeting. I came to the staff meeting uh, uh, on Thursday. We were praying for one another. And uh, I shared about my toothpaste. And uh, Raquel was praying for me. And Raquel starts praying. And it's just powerful. And she's like, Lord, you see the decay in Pastor Jan's tooth. Just decay, decay. He's decaying. He's falling apart. Decay, decay, decay. And that's all I heard. I'm like, I am, yep. And, uh, and I said, amen. We are, we're all decaying. I just want to just share that tremendous news. Uh, we are all mortal. We are all going to die. Time will be up for each one of us. Uh, the, the Lord knows when that is. But I'm, I'm telling you, dear soul, dear eternal soul, that moment will come. And you will stand before Jesus Christ. And you will stand before him as forgiven saint, welcome into the, uh, the presence of God, or he will stand before you like a judge. It's one or the other. This is what Jesus is saying, that the kingdom is inevitable. This is true. This is the greatest truth that there is. This is the truth underneath every single truth, that Jesus Christ is king. And the only way that we can be forgiven of our law-breaking, of our insubordination, of our rebellion against the king, is to fall on our knees and say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. Lord Jesus, I repent. And Jesus Christ says the love of God will be poured into your heart, the light of God will be poured into your mind, and you will be uh, transformed. And, and this has to be real for every, every believer. And when we meet friends who are not Christians, who are not followers of Christ, we, you need to believe that they are on their way to hell, eternal damnation apart from Jesus Christ. And this is why we proclaim the gospel. This is why we do what we do. This is the truth, and our job is to sow the seed of the gospel and not to be afraid of it, not to be afraid of, of speaking the truth. There are proponents of other religions who are 10 times, 100 times more courageous than most Christians today. If you, I watch the UFC. A lot of Muslim fighters are in there, and they're all inshallah, and they're just saying praise be to God. If God wills, they're just throwing in God in every... I'm like, imagine if believers did that, just on a daily basis, speaking the name of Christ every opportunity that we get, no matter what cost. Why? Because that's how important it is. On uh, Mark 4, 23, he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he's saying that ears to hear this message are a gift from God. Repentance is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God. But using the ears that God has given us, that's our responsibility. We are to say, Lord, tune our ears to hear your, your voice and give us grace to hear. In verse 24, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. The wake-up call is repeated and reinforced. Pay attention to what you hear. And he's not saying uh, it's just hearing per se, you hear. No, it's hearing to understand. It's hearing with the commitment to obey no matter what it says. And also he says, see what you hear. That's the original. It's the sense of hearing doubled by the sense of sight, suggesting we're going to use all of our faculties to listen to the word of God. And significant in the, in the wording, uh, the call is to pay attention not just to how we hear, but to what we listen to. Be careful 
in, in, in the voices you allow into your life, into your heart, in a world that is still in some sense Satan's house and his dominion, not all voices who claim to be speaking on behalf of God really are. Many of the voices are deceitful, um, perhaps even satanic uh, in claiming to be God's word. And uh, later on in, Matthew, in Mark 13, uh, Jesus says that Satan does everything he can to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So we as believers need to be careful, careful of, of the voices we allow. Listening to sermons is, is important. You should listen to sermons. But I, I want you versed in the scriptures more than you are in sermons so that you can discern, is this truly the word of God or not? Uh, on, on the other hand, when we listen to God's word with the intent to obey, God gives us more revelation. And as he does, he, he continues to uh, draw us to the calling that he has for us to go and preach the gospel, to, to receive and then also share the gains that we have. Romans 10, 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all believed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. In Ephesians 1.13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. He says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. And Mark here takes a phrase that was known in ancient literature, a phrase that had to do with giving. If you give to others, whatever you give will return to you, but here he applies it to epistemology, knowledge of God in particular. And what he's saying is, if you receive insight from the Lord, if you receive it with a welcome heart and a pure heart, you will get more insight. And the measure of our engagement with the word, the way we respond, our desire to grasp its message and digest its truth, no matter how hard to chew, will determine the measure of blessing we enjoy from it. Do you want more blessing? Of course we do. And he says, pay closer attention. The word teaches clearly that if you come close to God, he will come close to you. He will draw near to you. If you take a tiny step toward God, God will more than match the movement. In verse 25, he says, For to, the, to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Uh, Proverbs 13, 4 says, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Diligence. Are you diligent about your faith? The Christians that I know, that I've seen them grow spiritually by leaps and bounds, are those, or, or and the ones that have grown in spiritual prosperity, are those who are diligent. Diligent in their study of scripture on a daily basis. Diligent over private devotions and private prayer. Diligent over attending worship services and community groups. In the same way that exercise and use of muscles are strengthened with exercise, so that the soul is strengthened when we exercise the grace of the means of grace that God has given us. And we are to expend all energy to listen to the word and the promises that we will be proportionally rewarded. Those who heed the message get more understanding of the message, get more revelation, get more blessing. Those who do not heed the message end up with nothing. And the idea of the rich getting richer applies to truth. That God gives wisdom to the wise and he gives grace to those who long for insight and knowledge. Uh, for example, Daniel 2, 19 through 23, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells 
with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. So we are to pay careful attention to how we listen, to what we listen in terms of the word of God, and let the measure of your response to the word be full and complete and heartfelt and diligent and real. And those who give themselves to the word like this, they gain much. What do you gain when you pay attention to the word? You gain eternal life. You gain a relationship with God. You gain energy and strength to persevere despite trials. You gain comforts that the world cannot even imagine. And you gain a hope that no tragedy can touch. And you gain heaven itself. But to those who hear the word and do not respond like this, but respond with tepid indifference. Oh yeah, God. Oh yeah, God's word. Oh yeah, Christ dying on the cross bleeding, crucifixion, oh yeah, yawn, I've heard that before. Well, Jesus says those who listen like that, even what they have will be taken away. So the word of God, when proclaimed, no matter how familiar you are with the word, you can't ignore it. What a joy and peace we have in the word. Uh, In particular, watch for those texts in Holy Scripture where you are tempted to plug your ears with your fingers. No, that's not for me. Yeah, they say that that's God's word, but that's not for me. Uh, Pay close attention to those texts. Uh, Some of you have been walking with Christ for years, and your relationship with the Lord has just grown cold. There's no obvious rebellion in your life. But it just feels like your faith is like stale bread left out too long, dry, crusty, and moldy. The word used to come to you like fresh water from a rock in the desert, like manna from heaven. And now you just sit in services or you sit reading scripture and there's just nothing. There's no life. There's no interest. uh, There's just boredom. And at these moments, the Lord is speaking to you and say, pay attention. Pay attention to what you hear, how you hear, because the stakes are are that high. And Jesus today invites you to turn away from your lukewarmness and and draw near to him and ask the Lord, Lord, send me this hunger. Send me a thirst for your presence and for your word and give me this attentiveness, this, this desire to hear it no matter what and to obey and the Lord will meet you there. Second, sow the seed, trust God for growth and harvest is coming. Mark 4, 26 through 27, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. And the emphasis in this parable is uh, that God grows his kingdom, that God is the one that gives the growth. The farmer, all he does is plant the seed and then How it grows eludes his comprehension. It's beyond his control. He can't control how it grows. All he does is cast the seed and wait. And the seed germinates and develops by itself even while he is sleeping. He has no idea how it grows. And the Lord here is saying, I give the growth. This is uh, from 1 Corinthians. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Verse 28 The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Our job is to preach the word. Our job is to sow the seed of God's word. What God does with his word is his business. Uh, It's only for us to make sure we're faithful in our sowing. This is our responsibility. But God is the one that gives the growth, the soil can't produce life apart from the seed. But why? Because humans are dead in sin. Life must come from the outside, and it comes from the word of God. He says, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. The children of God are not born in perfect faith or perfect hope or perfect knowledge or experience. But the moment you become a child of God, even the weakest child of God is a true child of God. And the true child of God is expected by God to grow. If God began the process of salvation, he's promised he's going to complete it. And the process of salvation includes maturity and growth. Uh, Philippians 1, 6, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day 
of Jesus Christ. He's the one that starts the work and he will bring it to completion. What's our job? Uh, we are to grow, and uh, 1 Peter 3.18 says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And this is how the reign of God grows in your life. You grow in grace. Growing grace by the means of grace, studying scripture and praying and worshiping the Lord. Uh, and uh, we receive grace when we recognize that we've sinned. Lord, give me more grace. Empower me with that grace. And that's how maturity, that's how growth comes. The real causative agent of the word's fruition isn't the farmer. Uh, it's the seed. It's God himself. And he says, keep sowing, keep sowing, keep sowing until the day of harvest comes. And the day of harvest in scripture from Joel, from Revelation, we see the day of harvest is actually an image of judgment. A time when evil is judged and righteousness is vindicated. For example, Revelation 14, 15. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. The harvest is, in the Lord's parable, is a symbol of the end of the age, the last judgment, the consummation of history. We have the same text in Joel 3.13. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. And Jesus here is showing us a picture of the whole period uh, of world history from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ from his first advent to the next and Jesus saying the kingdom is growing the kingdom is growing the kingdom is going to sow the seed the kingdom is growing but a day will come when finally it's time for reaping and the harvest our job is to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom or to sow the seed of the word of God our task is not to attempt to manipulate the seed or force growth, or, or change the seed somehow. No, Jesus wants us to have complete confidence that there's life in the seed itself. The word of God is living and active, and the word of God is going to accomplish the, the work that God has for it. We are to trust in it, hope in it, and recognize uh, that the kingdom of God is unstoppable. The kingdom of God is inevitable, and God is going to save all of the Elect Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Uh, and one of the reasons why this church even exists is because we believe this. We've, we've believed this from the very beginning when we established the church. We said, what kind of church do we, we want to be a church that's faithful to God's word, and we want to do God's work God's way. And sometimes it does feel like the, the soil here isn't really soil, but it's kind of like concrete. And I remember a while back, uh, I was w walking my daughters to school, and I saw in uh, the pavement of the sidewalk a little, a little sprout growing. And I was like, oh, that's cute. And I was walked by, and then a few weeks later, I'm walking. It's a, uh, I look at it, I'm like, I can't believe it. It was a tomato plant, a tomato plant just out of the sidewalk with a little little tomato, and I, I should have plucked it. I should have plucked it. I should have had it. I, I didn't plant it, though. And it was just an image of, like, no matter what, like, God's seeds can break through even the hardness of payment. Can God save people in Boston, Massachusetts? Of course he can. And he does. And we, we see it uh, at this church, and we see, we see it in the other gospel proclaiming ministries we support and the point of, and this is what Jesus closes with, there's room for all in the kingdom of God. Mark 4.30, and he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? Uh, how do we understand the kingdom of God? And here he's quoting from Isaiah, to whom will we liken God, or what likeness compare with him? And Jesus is saying that this the kingdom is a kingdom that's going to grow. It starts... And it looks like a tiny little seed, as tiny even as a mustard seed, but it's going to grow because God promised. The previous parable is a call to patience. The seed's going to grow surely, slowly, but surely. This parable is a call to hope. It's not only going to grow, it's going to grow massively. So we can confidently sow and not grow weary, not grow discouraged, not lose heart. But remember the promise that God said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. We are to be content with the growth that God sends us, but we are never complacent. 
We, we are thankful for all, all the people that God saved here in and through this church and sanctifying, uh, but we're not complacent. Uh, we do believe that God wants this church to grow. He wants the kingdom of God to grow. We are a kingdom-building force. And what do we, how do we build the kingdom? By, by sowing the seed. And the seed can be even as small as a grain of mustard seed, verse 31. It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. And here Jesus is hyperbolic. Uh, he's comparing something very tiny, mustard seed, to something great. And that's the growth uh, that... Uh, comes from the mustard seed, uh, over 700 mustard seeds to a gram, and the height of the bush or the tree can grow to 10 feet. And what he's saying is the, the kingdom of God grows like this. In the beginning, uh, the, the beginnings are small, paltry in appearance, uh, but there's tremendous power, divine potency in the word of God. The mustard seed is chosen because of its commonness and because of its smallness. But it grows into something vast and incredible. And what is Jesus here saying? He's saying, well, well, look how the kingdom came into the world initially. In weakness. How did the king of kings, the king of the universe, come into this world? He came as a baby, born in a manger at Bethlehem. Without riches, without armies, without attendants, without power. And who are the men that God chose to build his church? Who were the appointed apostles? Just average men. And what was the last pu public act of Jesus' earthly ministry as the king of kings? Well, he was crucified between two criminals, between two thieves. And he was forsaken by his disciples, betrayed by one, denied by another. And what was the doctrine that the first apostles, the first builders of the church, what was the doctrine they preached? They preached Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and to Greeks. It was foolishness. But because of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit took that message, that we have all sinned, we have all transgressed the commandments of God, Jesus Christ lived a perfect life on our behalf, and then he died on a cross as our substitutionary atonement, and then he rose on the third day, and whoever believes in Christ has all of their sins blotted out, forgiven. It's as if God casts our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. He chooses to forget, not just forgive, but forget our sin. When that message was proclaimed and the Holy Spirit took it and applied it to people's hearts, lives were changed. The world was changed in the same way that the gospel changed people's lives then. He does so today. In all this, the mind of man can only look at Christ, can only look at his disciples and see weakness and feebleness. But we as believers, we understand that beyond the feebleness, beyond the weakness is the power of God, a power that can truly save. Mark 4.32, yet when it is sown, it grows up and it becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now this phrase, birds of the air, is used in Ezekiel 31 and Daniel 4. Uh, it's to represent the multitude of the nations. That the kingdom grows and it's going to grow in vastness. And then people of all nations are going to come and build nests within this tree. Uh, Ezekiel 17, 23, on the mountain height of Israel will I plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar, and under it will dwell every kind of bird in the shadow of its branches. Birds of every sort will nest. Every time this phrase is used in the Old Testament, describing a mighty kingdom, be it Israel or Egypt or Babylon, that they, the kingdoms will grow in vastness, that the other nations will come and seek refuge in this kingdom. What Jesus is saying here is, my kingdom is like that. My kingdom, the kingdom of God, is like this, though its beginnings are improbable, a small seed, a crucified Messiah, a suffering church, preaching, baptizing, and holding Holy Communion, praying. Its beginnings are improbable, but its destiny is vast, and there's room for all. In, in the kingdom of God, there's room for every single one of you. There's room for every single one of your families. There's room for everyone in the world that will come and repent and to build a nest. I like the idea of just building a little nest with your loved ones in the kingdom of God. He's like, make sure you're building this, this home that you have in the kingdom of God. Come and find shelter, Jesus is saying, in the shade of this 
kingdom. The parable, the parable emphasizes the shelter that the kingdom brings in Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Jesus concludes our text in Mark 4.33. With many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable but privately to his own disciples he explained everything as they were able to hear according to their God-given ability to hear. And what he's saying is, and he concludes with this, if you want more revelation, you do it by spending more time with Christ, by following Christ, by communing with him and abiding in him. Three points to summarize and then we'll close with prayer. Love the light, hunger for truth, and then share the gains. Sow the seed, trust God for growth, harvest is coming, and there's room for all in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for continuing to build your kingdom in and through us, in this city, in a place of uh, stifling darkness, sometimes it seems. But Lord, you are the light, and you're the light that shines in the darkness. And Lord, as you saved us, we believe that you can save others, and we pray that you use us in the process. Even this week, Lord, give us opportunities to speak of you, speak of the gospel, speak of your grace. We pray that you open the door for the proclamation of the gospel here. We pray for a revival in this city and beyond. We pray for an awakening, and we pray that, Lord, you save many and draw them to yourself and to your incredible kingdom. And we pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.